My name is Kelsey Moss, and I am the Associate Director here at Preservation Utah. Um, we are Utah's statewide historic preservation nonprofit. If you're not familiar with our work, we've been around for 55 years. Um, we focus on advocacy and education of historic preservation in the state of Utah. And today we are so excited to talk to you about the Provo Temple. Um, I can tell you in this work, a lot of times when it comes to issues of modernism and in the more recent past, um, there's a little bit of confusion, uh, maybe not seeing the value or understanding why we should care about these places. And um, it's easy to, to defend and protect, you know, that Victorian mansion on the hill. Um, but sometimes there's questions about brutalism and, or uh, the international style, these, these, these symbols, these, these structures, these places that maybe our grandparents knew, maybe we, we know, our parents knew, um, so it doesn't seem so distant, so historic, but they are really important aspects of our, our story, of our community, and so we're really excited to talk to you today, um, specifically about Provo Temple and how it is shaped um, Utah. So our wonderful executive director, David Amet is gonna be doing this presentation today. Um, before I hand it over to him, we have everyone on mute just to make it a little bit easier. So if you have questions, we highly recommend just put them in the chat. We're gonna have times for uh, time for question and answers at the end. Um, so please put them in the chat. I'll put reminders in there and we'll make sure to get to all your questions. So without further ado, David. Thank you so much, Kelsey, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is a real treat to be able to talk to you about the Provo Temple. Uh, before I started uh, researching the Provo Temple, really this past year, uh, this was a building that was very familiar to me. And yet, as I delved into the history, I realized how much I overlooked some obvious points about the, uh, the building, its architecture, and of course, its history. Uh, these were things I didn't know as of even um, a few months ago, a few weeks ago in some, in some instances. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share my findings with you and my uh, enthusiasm for this building and, and uh, hope that we all leave this conversation with a better understanding of why the temple, uh, Provo Temple matters. And, and not just why it matters, I've also added to the title of this uh, lecture, why it matters to preserve. Why is it important specifically to keep this building standing? Even if the building disappears, uh, it will still matter. But why does it matter to preserve specifically? Uh, at the top of the lecture, I do want to introduce you to the general format of our discussion, just so you have a roadmap as to where we are going to go over the next few minutes together. Uh, I realize that for many of you on the call, uh, what is a temple uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a very familiar concept. To some of you on the call, that may not be the case. So I do want to just touch on briefly, what is a temple? Uh, and I also want to discuss uh, with you what is historic preservation. Some of you are longtime advocates for historic preservation. Others of you may be entering the conversation for the very first time. So to get us all on the same page, I want to discuss those two key points. Then I want to discuss why preserve, preserving the Provo Temple is so important. And I'm gonna be doing that by comparing it with other temples first, talking about its history in Provo, in the Provo context specifically, uh, the evolution of its design and how it's performed over the last 50 years. It will turn 50 this next February. And then I'll touch briefly at the end on its deconstruction and reconstruction, or at least what we, what we know about the process uh, and what we saw happen in, in Ogden, which was, of course, a sister temple to Provo up until the very recent past. Um, before we launch to a few friends of mine, uh, books, and in one case, an individual who has been instrumental in helping me shape my ideas about the Provo temple. And these are sources I would ask all of you to turn to, even after our discussion today, to find out more about this building and its context and the, and the history which really helped to shape it. Um, the first three uh, images on this slide, uh, David O. McKay, The Rise of Modern Mormonism, uh, written primarily by uh, Greg Prince, 
prologue bolts, which are pri written primarily by Richard Co uh, um, Cohen, and uh, Building Zion by Thomas Carter are really magnificent studies uh, on uh, David O. McKay specifically and, and how his administration shaped this building. Of course, Provost Two Temples talks specifically about um, the evolution of, of the two temples in Provo, as the title suggests, and building design kind of delves into more pioneer era history, uh, but presents ideas uh, about this pioneer era history of Utah that I think are very relevant even to the recent past. And then finally, I want to introduce all of you to a dear friend of mine, Ellen Barnett, who has probably of any human on the earth spent the most time thinking about the Provo Temple. He grew up in the shadow of this building and we have had a series of really wonderful discussions even over the past few days leading up to this presentation about what that building means. And a lot of the ideas I'm presenting to you today are generated really out of Alan's uh, keen intellect and, and mind. And so Alan, if you're on the call, thank you. I look forward to having subsequent discussions with you about this building. So now that you know what series and, and sets of ideas we are bringing into the presentation, I do want to, as I noted, discuss in basic terms what temples are. For those of you who have never gone into this building, even a, during an open house, you've only maybe passed them on the outside. Um, temples, according to the Church of Jesus Christ.org, are literally houses of God. They are where God communes with his people on earth. They are places where individuals can go to make sacred promises with God, fill his spirit, and escape the hectic demands of day-to-day -day life. Uh, in this respect, they are not churches or meeting houses, which are more um, for public weekly or, or uh, even, even um, bi-weekly cultural or worship services. Uh, Temples are places that are truly set apart. In many ways, uh, you go to a temple to deal with I questions of identity, uh, who you are, where you came from, what you're doing here in your time on earth, and where you can expect to go after uh, your experience on earth ends. So in that respect, and I hope this transition isn't too clumsy, this question of identity, which is central to Temple worship is also very central to historic preservation. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation had this quote up on their Instagram feed uh, just a few days ago, and I, and I borrowed it for the purposes of our talk today. Historic preservation provides the foundation for our understanding of how and why activities occurred and the context and structure of truth. When we learn about our history and the values of this history as expressed the built environment, the values of our culture, the values of a certain people, values of, of uh, patrons of the built environment, we develop confidence in knowing the challenges that were overcome for progress to be made today. So preservation is also about identity and keeping buildings around says a lot about who we are, how we got here, and also what we value from the past. And then this key aspect, keeping the Provo Temple around, just to address that question, is important because the Provo Temple documents a pivotal chapter of Latter-day Saint history, a moment when the church was preparing itself for unprecedented global growth. How do we take this experience offered by the Church of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the world is really a central question that the Provo Temple addresses head on. And for this reason, the Provo Temple's design stands out, especially among modern temples, many of which take direct cues from the Provo Temple. The architect of the Provo Temple, a man who I'll introduce you to more thoroughly in just a few minutes, a man named Emil Fetzer, said that after the Provo Temple was built, and the Ogden Temple as well, because these again were sister temples, there was a piece of the Provo Temple in every single temple design. And I think even though Emil Fetzer is no longer the, the head church architect, the same is true for temples that are being built even in 2021 and anticipated for the future. Even the temple that is designed to replace the Provo Temple owes a lot to this original building. 
Uh, if this temple can survive, that is, if the Provo Temple can survive, its unique building, this, it's, this building's unique beauty will become more evident with time. Oftentimes we find in preservation that buildings go through what is referred to colloquially as an ugly phase from about 20 years to 50 years. They are deemed as uh, disposable because their aesthetic or their construction doesn't accord with modern tastes or ideas. If buildings can survive beyond that. Remember, the Provo Temple will turn 50 this next February. We can just get the Provo Temple through this, uh, this proposed uh, reconstruction, then I'm convinced that generations forward will appreciate these efforts that we take today to save this building. Generations moving forward will truly appreciate the unique beauty and the uniqueness of the building as a singular building now, uh, as time moves on. Now I want to contextualize the Provo Temple in sort of the trajectory of, of temple design and temple building by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you were to say to a historian who follows this conversation of, of Provo or of, of temple development, what are the three temples that matter most in the history of, of the, uh, the church constructing temples? They would see and ha about that question. They may say, well, every temple has contributed something to this larger conversation, the development of the specific type of building. But if you really help that historian's feet to the fire, they would say it's three temples that really have made a, a, a statement about the evolution of this building type and, and an evolution of temple worship generally. Those three temples would be starting with the Kirtland Temple, the, the earliest temple that the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints constructed in Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, because this, of course, is the first temple, and it's an experimental building in many respects. It's a new type of building for a new type of purpose. One thing I think that helped make this temple particularly palatable to uh, the people who constructed it and, and the saints who worshipped in it was that the design was so familiar on so many aspects. The inside is unique in that it has essentially two meeting rooms, one on the ground floor, one on the second floor, and one up in the attic space. And these meeting rooms were unique in that they had, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, competing or facing pulpits. There was a stacked a series of pulpits on the right, a stacked series of pulpits on the other in both the lower meeting hall and the upper meeting hall. But beyond that, if you were to look at this building, particularly from the outside, you would see a building that was very familiar to you, especially if you lived in Ohio in the 1830s. This was a building type that had been constructed in New England and even the Southern states out to the edges of the American frontier, what was then the American frontier for decades, really going back into the 18th century. This is essentially a parish church. So this is where the conversation started with this very familiar building type with a few modifications to acknowledge the unique purpose of the building. From there, the idea of the temple begins to evolve. We have the Nauvoo Temple, which was built in 1836, is when it was ultimately finished, that followed many of the same cues as the Kirtland Temple. This temple had a lot of large meeting rooms, but before the saints left Nauvoo, they had started to use the upstairs. What they did in the upstairs at the attic uh, level is, is essentially drop curtains or, or sheets to put that space into, into smaller components. They had began to use this uh, attic space as a progressive type of experience. Each one of these uh, curtain defined spaces or volumes was used for an evolving endowment ceremony. And this uh, endowment ceremony, which requires you, at least at this stage of time, to move from room to room, really crystallized uh, in, in, in the first uh, sort of architectural way uh, in the endowment house, which is a building that no longer survives, but was on Temple Square, where, as, as if I understand correctly, where the North Visitor Center stood until very recently. 
the first temple to adopt this plan was the Logan Temple. And um, you see in the Logan Temple, uh, the series of rooms that would be used for various stages of uh, temple worship, um, fully fleshed out. Uh, but of course, the Logan Temple's interior doesn't survive. The only temple now of that pioneer era uh, construction that has this floor plan is the Manti Temple. And this was a floor plan that, as many of you who follow uh, temple practice, temple worship, our general architectural uh, conversations in Utah, know that this was a floor plan that was threatened even as recently as this uh, spring, but fortunately has been saved. Again, we have a unique building, but one like the Kirtland Temple that would have been on many levels familiar to the saints who built the structure. In many ways, and this goes back to what Tom Carter was proposing in Building Zion, this building references the sorts of mansions that people were constructing in this high Second Empire style, this, this Victorian style. Even in Utah, a great example of this is the Gardo House. When you went into the temple, the spaces inside this building would have felt very familiar, particularly certain spaces which resembled wealthy, uh, uh, wealthy individuals' living room. Um, so this is a building that is both strange and very familiar, and it's the familiarity that helps to, I think, bridge uh, the, the, um, the, the understanding right? The, the church is developing with this new architectural type. It's this familiarity that helps people feel comfortable with this building, even as they go through it and participate in this evolving ceremony. Now, as we move into the 20th century, temples begin to evolve again in, uh, uh, in response to uh, two essential concerns. The first concern is the desire of church leaders to make the temple experience a global experience. How do we take temples off of the Wasatch Front or out of the American West and make this experience uh, possible for members of the Church of Jesus Christ to enjoy around the world? Uh, one of the important temples in this development is the Swiss Temple, which is built like the, the um, Manti Temple or the Logan Temple or, or Salt Lake Temple was built with a series of rooms that you would walk through in, as you progress through the, the temple experience. But over time was adapted for the use of film. This was the other concern that the uh, church leadership had is how do we make the endowment more efficient? How do we get more people through the temple, especially as we are dealing with this issue of, of globalization and even the language barriers that globalization presents. So they adopt film and start showing films in these temple rooms. This idea of the use of films was brought to the United States um, via the Oakland Temple. The Oakland Temple was a unique temple in that it was built basically with two uh, ordinance or, or film viewing rooms that entered or centered on a, 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 a central room called the celestial room, which is sort of the, the highest uh, 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 space or, or, or highest defined space in the temple experience itself. And so as you <clears throat> entered the Oakland temple, what you would do is rather than go through a series of rooms, you would enter into these, uh, one of these two singular rooms, uh, viewing uh, rooms for the film, and then you uh, ultimately end up uh, in the central celestial room. So this idea of film and adaptation to be more efficient and globalization started to crystallize, particularly with the Swiss and Oakland temples. But it wasn't until the Provo temple that the ideas of modern efficiency, of modern technology was fully crystallized and these ideas were fully embraced. And that is why the Provo temple is so important in the evolution of temple architecture. And after the Provo Temple was built, the church really never goes back with, with I guess, a few exceptions. 99% of the temples that are constructed by the church today follow the model, the precedent that was crystallized in the Provo and, of course, its sister temple, the Ogden Temple. So let's talk about the Provo Temple and what forces, what 
sort of larger forces uh, help to shape this building and help to form this very unique structure. Provo, even at an early stage of its development, anticipated getting a temple. As many of you who, who are familiar with Provo know, there is a part of Provo, specifically a part of BYU campus, that is still referred to as Temple Hill. And that is because even in the pioneer stage of Provo's development, uh, 16 acres or four Provo blocks, which are four by four, four acres each, 16 acres of these of four blocks were set apart on Temple Hill to build the temple. And that tradition of Temple Hill started then, continues even to the present day, the reference of, of, the, of, the, of the hill's name as the Temple Hill. Now, if you look at this plat of Provo, you, and, and if you know Provo um, well, you can see that this plat is really impossible. There's a huge um, uh, incline that runs along essentially the edge of 8th North, which is this 15th Street, and makes all of this really impossible to have developed. So this map is a little off, but it shows sort of the idea that the city was eventually going to center around the temple block that the city would develop in, in and around this block, and this block would be an important feature of Provo. Now what ultimately happens is that the temple block is eventually taken by BYU, and instead of temples of worship, constructed on this hill, temples of learning are instead built there. We have Ware and Traganza's Mazer building, which was built on the crest of Temple Hill, where the temple was going to go in about 1911. So the Mazer building appears there, and BYU starts to spread out along Temple Hill and fill that space. But the idea of the temple coming to Provo was still an idea that people clung on to. So what ultimately made the temple possible? in Provo? What brought that building to this city, to this community? It's really the ideas of David O. McKay, his vision for the church. Uh, I like this quote, which was um, stated by Philip Barlow, who's up at USU. He's the chair of Mormon history and culture there at uh, Utah State University. And in referencing David O. McKay's legacy, he stated, no one during the modern era of church history was more central to the direction of the church than was David O. McKay, who served in its highest councils for three quarters of a century. So David O. McKay was central to this church. He was, I can't remember when he joined these high councils of the church, I believe it was in the 20s or 30s. But from that point, 20s, 30s, up through the, really the early 1970s, he was absolutely in a central position to help shape the church in the direction it would go. And in terms of architecture, no landscape better articulates um, David O. McKay's vision than this landscape showing BYU, the MTC, and ultimately the Provo Temple here on this new Temple Hill. In many ways, David O. McKay's push was to push the church beyond the Wasatch Front, as we've already stated. This was very important to President McKay. He had a global perspective. More than any other church president before him, he had experienced the world. He had gone on a world tour to understand how the church could expand to new horizons. He had served as a mission president for the church's European mission for a time. So he understood how the church was situated in the global um, sphere of things and how the church could strengthen its position in this global sphere. But in order to do that, in order to globalize the church, he understood there were institutions even back on the Wasatch Front that needed strengthening. One institution that he helped to strengthen in conjunction with Ernest Wilkinson, a longtime president of BYU, was BYU itself. Under um, the direction of President Wilkinson and in conjunction with David O. McKay, BYU expanded exponentially uh, in the post-war years. Um, David O. McKay was famous for uh, asserting the idea that every member should be a missionary. He helped to institutionalize the practice of serving missions, especially for young uh, men who were uh, active members of the LDS Church. And so even in the 1950s, there was conversations about developing a language training center or even a campus where this language training 
would take place uh, in Provo and associating a temple with it. And of course, David O. McKay was instrumental in shaping the Provo temple. And when the Provo temple conversation came up and was really pursued in the mid 1960s, it was this idea of experimenting with the idea of the temple as a way to solve Wasatch Front problems, but also to take the temple worship experience to the world. So that is where we get to the point where the temple starts to take actual shape and form. In 1966, David O. McKay approaches a young architect, uh, recently graduated from uh, uh, the, um, USC in, in California, um, about designing a temple. And he says, Brother Fetzer, I would like you to design an economical and functional temple for Ogden and for Provo. We can't continue to build huge monuments. We have to have temples that membership can use to do efficient temple work. And the full quote actually uh, from David McKay uh, in, in this conversation that he has with Brother Fetzer specifies that David O. McKay was thinking when he says we can't continue to build huge monuments, he was thinking about how to take this temple experience to the global growing church population. That was specifically mentioned in this conversation. And so with these marching orders, uh, Emil Fetzer then leaves David O. McKay's office and thinks about the temple for the next several days. And it was on actually a plane ride that uh, Emil Fetzer takes to go uh, attend to some church needs in Europe, that the idea of the Provo Temple begins to crystallize. And according to Emil Fetzer's own account, this idea crystallized in a vision-like experience. So Emil Fetzer says, as he designs the Provo Temple, we had settled in our seats, our plane seats, and had a little meal at midnight, and I started talking with my companion about this assignment I had to design these two temples, one in Provo again and one in Ogden. All of a sudden, it was in my mind as if I was walking through a building. I started to describe Brother Baker what I was seeing, the recommend desk, the inner foyer, the locker room, and then on the upper floor, the ceiling rooms. But most important was the floor above the ceiling room. There was a central room surrounded by a cluster of six ordinance rooms. And I knew exactly how these six rooms were to function from the way I saw it. This was a very intriguing thing, a central celestial room surrounded by a cluster of six ordinance rooms. Now, remember, there had been a precedent for this at the Oakland Temple, but there was not six of these rooms at the Oakland Temple. This is a temple, even from this, this, this this, this, this initial conceptualization of the building that was built to be efficient, a workhorse temple, to get the temple work done. The idea was that the whole ceremony would be in one room instead of going from room to room like in the Salt Lake Temple. When I got home, I sat down at my desk, took a clean piece of paper, and drew the first line that eventually became the Ogden and Provo temples. It wasn't hard to put this plan together because I had walked through it in my mind. I knew exactly how this temple was to be organized and how it was going to function. Later, uh, Emil Fetzer says that he got the initial idea for this temple from a park that he had visited in Copenhagen. And this park was surrounded by a roadway and had various uh, different sidewalks and, and accesses that got you to the center of the park itself, much like the park that you see on the screen. This wasn't the park that Emil Fetzer saw, but it's very much like that park. So this idea of a central hallway or passageway and various different compartments that ultimately based on a center was instrumental in this envisioning, this initial envisioning of the Provo Temple and Ogden Temple. So this is the temple that ultimately becomes the Provo Temple. I'm gonna to have to thank uh, Alan Barnett again for lending me these images. These are images that he produced for a presentation he did on the Provo Temple some time ago. In the basement area was going to be the baptismal font, baptismal font being near the earth, which is a reference to the idea of, of dying in baptism, being brought back uh, into life, to Christ-like life as a member of the church. So the baptismal font is at the 
uh, basement at level of the temple along with the mechanical, the laundry, and the cafeteria. And then you get to the ground level or first floor level. You have uh, offices, the foyer, and locker rooms, the, uh, the dressing rooms to prepare you to go into on the second level, the ceiling rooms. And if you can bring up an image of the Provo Temple, these ceiling rooms are in that band of gold glass that sits between the podium level, that ground floor level of the temple and the upper story, which is where uh, on the third floor, you have the ordinance rooms and the celestial room accessed via a peripheral hallway. So again, like that park in Copenhagen, all of these rooms are accessed by a hallway that goes all the way around the building. And then the ordinance rooms allow for access into the center feature of this third story, which is the slush room. This is a very novel new type of temple. No other temple really has this basic floor plan. And in many ways, the uh, floor plan follows uh, the principles of modernist architecture, which is an architecture that is defined by the idea of form follows function. So again, you have the baptismal font, the dressing rooms, the ceiling rooms, the celestial room, and the spire, all in accordance. Oh, and I should I put this escalator in so I wouldn't uh, forget. All of this is in accordance with modernist principles, which emphasize the efficient, the, um, the streamlined and the technological. In between many of these floors, there weren't flights of steps, rather there were escalators as a way to bring just that much, that extra dose, that, 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 that extra uh, portion of modern efficiency and mechanism into the, the temple itself to make the building run even just that much more smoothly with the benefit of this modern technology. So, we have a modernist temple now that is being designed um, according to these principles of efficiency and maximum use and, and, and the idea of bringing this temple experience to the world through this, through this new floor plan uh, inspired by modernist principles. Just to sort of flesh out what these modernist principles are even further, we have, of course, the idea of form for all its function. We also have a stress on making the structure visible Simplicity of form, uh, which is a source of pleasing aesthetic. It's not too goopy and gaudy and frosting-like. Rather, it's streamlined and easy to understand and beautiful. Uh, use of modern manufactured materials, uh, steel, moldable concrete, transparent glass. All of this was honest material. This was material that spoke to its origins, to its, uh, its, its even um, material makeup, its composition. And all of this helps to make the building operate as a machine, as smoothly as a machine should operate. Not only do we have escalators on the outside, we also have revolutionary new concepts happening on the exterior, especially this drop-off pickup area. Many of you who have ever visited this temple probably have taken this cantilevered uh, auto um, canopy for granted. It's just a part of the temple. But when this temple was conceived, this was really the first building of its type to have this level of convenience delivered to the patrons of the building. If you think of, for example, the Salt Lake Temple, you have to park sometimes even blocks away, walk into the temple uh, at a great distance, perhaps in the rain. Here, of course, in the Provo Temple, um, you can drive up and, and let people off even um, directly in front of the doors and then, and then park your car and have a quick walk into the building. So even on the exterior, you have this efficiency, this modern technology being incorporated, the technology of the automobile, for example, not just on the ins inside. And of course, all of this I want to contrast to the Sully Temple, just to help you appreciate how novel and new all of these ideas were. The Salt Lake Temple uh, was developed uh, basically from the outside in, in contrast with the Provo Temple, which was from the inside out. I think it's interesting to compare the envisioning of the building, as uh, experienced by Emil Fetzer in the case of the Provo Temple, to the envisioning of the Salt Lake Temple, as documented by Brigham Young. Um, but this is something he said at the Salt Lake Temple Cornerstone Ceremony, where he, he was visiting the site of would eventually become Salt Lake Temple, 
Uh, five years ago last July, I was here and saw in spirit the temple not 10 feet from where we had laid the chief cornerstone. I have not inquired what kind of a temple we should build. Why? Because it was represented before me. I have never looked upon that ground, but the vision of it was there. I see it as plainly as if it was in reality before me. Wait until it is done. So we have Brigham Young seeing the Salt Temple from the outside in, if he even saw it from the inside. The, the plan of the Salt Lake Temple changes dramatically even in the final years of this, of this uh, temple's construction. Ultimately, what the Salt Lake Temple does is accommodate the practice of taking a, uh, an ordinance from start to finish, from baptism to final sealing in the space of a single day, as opposed to what we have going on in the Provo Temple, which is taking ordinances uh, separately. You can go in and just do baptisms and the floor plan accommodates that. You can just go in and do ceilings and the floor plan accommodates that. You can go in and just do um, the, the ordinance work in the upper third story and the floor plan accommodates that. In the Salt Lake Temple, that was not the way things were done. And therefore all these rooms are rather mixed together. You have ceiling rooms, for example, immediately off of the celestial room. You don't have that on the separate floor. So all of this is really radical new envisioning of how temples work in the modernist paradigm. Now, I want to go back to the slide of basic principles of modernism. One of the key elements of modernism, at least traditional classical international modernism, is that the buildings that are constructed in the style are free of references of past architectural styles. And I have that uh, italicized here at the bottom of this list. That is true for high modernist buildings, but not for modernist buildings, many modernist buildings constructed at the time that the Provo Temple was constructed. That is because the Provo Temple was constructed in a branch of modernism called New Formalism. New Formalism, in contrast to high international modernism, embraced classical precedents, uh, forms like arches, colonnades, columns and tablatures, which take you really back to Greece and Rome, even thousands of years ago in architectural history. In the spirit of Greece and Rome even, uh, these buildings use traditionally ripped materials, travertine, marble, granite, or other man-made materials that mimic uh, marbles or granite's luxurious qualities. Concrete, for example, can be made to mimic these other uh, sorts of, of building materials, traditional building materials. Buildings are set on a podium in a very classical way, designed to achieve modern monumentality, smooth wall surfaces, delicacy of details, formal landscape, use of pools, fountains, sculpture within a central plaza. Examples of new formalism would include Lincoln Center, um, a, a building that's actually being highlighted in a movie that's come out this Christmas, a West Side Story. Um, that takes in and around the site that will in, in, in the movie's context, shortly become Lincoln Center. We have uh, the Empire State Plaza, um, another of uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller's uh, ideas and plans um, for Albany in that case. Uh, on the East Coast, we have the Los Angeles uh, Music Center, this wonderful building designed by Welton Beckett internationally. We have Brasilia, all happening around the time that the Provo and Ogden temples are being designed. Uh, here locally, we have the Salt Palace. Uh, we have this amazing building, now the Auto Mart, but was originally the Bank of Salt Lake with all of these uh, empty rivets holding these balls once upon a time. I think this is an amazing building. It's just a wonderful thing. And then even in Pro, we have elements of this new formalism being introduced elsewhere beyond the temple. Uh, one of my favorite buildings in Provo, which of course is no longer uh, standing is the Winter Garden Ice Creek, designed by um, uh, BYU engineering professor Arnold Wilson. Uh, many of you will remember this as the Reams uh, boot barn, I think it was, right before it was demolished or for much of its life. So the Provo Temple and the Ogden Temple were very much in this context of new formalism. They were buildings that embraced the future enthusiastically, and that's one of the things I think you can feel as you look at the Provo Temple and the uh, former Ogden Temple, you can feel the enthusiasm and the excitement about the future in this space age, but they also embrace the past, and they straddle the past and the, and the future in this unique way. 
But one thing I do want to uh, highlight, especially in relation to the provenance and temples, is this last uh, uh, item on the list, the delicacy of details. I think a lot of these new formless buildings are meant to be absorbed by quickly passing in a car. Because this is, of course, an age which loves cars and automobiles are being embraced right and left, even to the point where, you know, they are accommodated in the pickup and drop off of the Provo and Ogden temples. But if you drive past these buildings in a car and take a look at them while speeding by at 40 miles an hour, you miss so much of what made these buildings not um, just interesting from a distance, but really delicate uh, up close and, and, uh, and, and engageable. So here we have the Ogden Temple, and just to highlight some of the differences, the architectural differences between the former Ogden and the Provo Temple, especially as we get up close. In the Ogden Temple, we have these wonderful flat panels that were ornamented by, um, I don't know what to call these except for dentai or, 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 or teeth-like uh, designs that uh, came down the, oops, that came down the sides of these panels and then of course decorated the, uh, the top of this podium on which the upper level of the temple sat. Then you have these exquisite grills made out of these classically modernist forms, these parabolic arches, which interlaced and interwove as they went down the building. You can imagine how this building, especially with the passage of light would change. The texture of the concrete would change as you looked at it with passage of light. Uh, in some Parts of the day, these dentai would be highlighted and other parts of the day, they'd be in shadow. The building was always at play. Of course, you leave the um, drum where the ordinance rooms were and you go up to this beautiful spire made of parabolic scoops. And, uh, and originally, of course, this was all in gold and it just sort of cascaded up in this exciting and engaging way. Uh, originally, the uh, temple did not have an angel on it. was proposed to have an angel Moroni, at least per this architectural drawing. And if you can make out the angel Moroni that was proposed for this temple, you can see what a wonderful bit of sculpture this is. It sort of extends naturally out of the, uh, the, uh, the spire itself and then becomes this uh, obtuse-like triangle with the second obtuse-like triangle extending out, forming the, the arm and the horn. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of sculptural architecture and, and art. So, that's what the Provo Temple or the Ogden Temple was all about. If you go to the Provo Temple, again, you can drive by, set into a field. In many ways, the setting of the Provo Temple is much more successful than the, um, than the Ogden Temple because it's set so far above and beyond other buildings that might compete with it, unlike the Ogden Temple, which was set right down in the city itself. But the Provo Temple, and if you drive by and look at it quickly, you do not fully register this building. It's only on close inspection that you see the lovely forms that Emil Fetzer introduced into the building itself. Um, he uses, instead of the parabolic arch, um, what is uh, most pronouncedly used on the Provo Temple is this uh, lancet arch or this, um, this medieval um, uh, Gothic arch, which of course is appropriate for a building um, of, of spiritual purpose, because by using this arch this motif, you are connecting this modernist building, this future looking building to a deep rich past. Uh, this this uh, lancet type arch is used on the lower windows. I'm sorry, I do not have a better picture of these windows. I meant to take one, uh, but these windows are absolutely beautifully designed. Um, it's one of the, the highlights of the building. So next time you approach this building, I hope you all have a chance to do so. Look at these windows on the lower podium. They introduce this arch and then the arch is carried through um, in this repeating way up through the drum. These wonderful cast concrete um, uh, domino-like things that, that peel off softly. They sort of flare out at the very top, which creates sort of a lovely form, which then takes you up to the spire, which also has in, in a very subtle way, these arches see these pointed arches that go all the way up. And then of course, you can imagine the spire with a similar uh, Angel Moroni to the one that was originally designed for the Ogden Temple. It was exquisite, even without the Angel Moroni, the spire was really exquisite. Now, instead of using these parabolic scoops, we have sort of a, a fountain-like effect with uh, 
with these arches leading up to these um, sort of cascading concrete forms, or, or actually, I think, guess the, the spire was made of cast aluminum is what I understand, that sort of bubble up to the very top. Now, of course, um, the uh, Provo Temple is not universally embraced. We have some people who think it looks like a spaceship, even at the early, early stage of um, its history. Uh, we have this uh, Pat Bagley cartoon that makes that point. Some people think that it looks like a bank. On the more sort of reverential side of, of uh, interpretation, we have other people that compare it to a flower, like a lotus flower, with a steeple forming the golden center and the petals falling out from that center. And then, of course, we have the, um, the, the narrative that it represents, the pillar of fire uh, by night and the, and the cloud by day going back to the Old Testament. And what's wonderful about this building is that all of these interpretations are correct. Um, sure, it can look like a spaceship, but what better reference for a building that is supposed to take you out of this world and transport you to a world where even God inhabits, right? God being not of this world. It does look like a bank, you know, in many ways, because a lot of banks, including this one in Salt Lake, the Zions Bank, were designed in this new formalist uh, mode of, of architecture. And they were designed this way to stand out, to be prominent in the landscape. So that is entirely appropriate. Yes, it could be a flower, and it also could be this, this cloud and pillar of fire, going back to Old Testament themes. So yes, it could be all of this. And that's one of the wonders of this building, is that it is open to your interpretation. And no interpretation is wrong, no interpretation is right. It is left up for you to decide, to conclude what this building is all about, which is not what all buildings allow people to do. A lot of the buildings, especially of, of a religious nature, impose a certain idea or uh, a concept on you. But this temple leaves it open, which I think is one of its, uh, its, its greatest assets. So how did the temple perform? It performed incredibly well. From the time the new temple opened, temples opened, being, of course, Provo and Ogden, they were very busy. During 1973, the first full year that these temples were in service, 60.5% of all ordinances worldwide were performed in the Logan, Ogden, Salt Lake, Provo, and Mount temples. 17.7% of the church's total was performed in the Provo Temple alone. For the next quarter of a century, the Provo Temple led the church in the total number of the endowments performed for the dead. Even when the estimated participation from Brigham Young University and nearby missionary training centers was were subtracted, there's a wonderful story that even early on the numbers of ordinances that were performed in the Provo and Ogden temples were taken before the church leadership, the, the uh, church presidency, and members of the Quorum of the Twelve, and they were actually dismayed to hear that the Provo and Ogden temples were performing so well because, in many ways, it reduced the importance, the prominence, the supremacy of particularly the Salt Lake Temple, which had long been sort of the temple that represented the center of the Mormon faith. So we move 50 years into the present, or nearly 50 years in the case of the Ogden, 50 years, of course, in the case of the Provo. Mormon Temple in Ogden to get a makeover. Goodbye, state of space age design. Now we will know what the Provo Temple will look like. So the Ogden Temple was, of course, made to, into a new temple, and the Provo Temple, as was announced just a few weeks ago, will follow suit, unless, of course, plans change. What does this really look like? Here are uh, images that were made available to me, again, courtesy of Alan Barnett. Thank you, Alan. That shows the Ogden Temple fully intact, and then how the building was deconstructed, all of the paneling was taken off. Here we have the spire lying in heaps, much like a, a, a column from ancient Greece or Rome. And then finally, the core of the building as reduced down to what was ultimately used in the reconstruction of the building. And I imagine the same process or something similar to this will happen uh, with the Provo. Now, why does Preservation Utah, why do I, on a personal level, think that this is sad. It's because, oh, and this shows sort of the evolution of, of um, the uh, 
Ogden Temple to its, its new incarnation. This is what it looks like today, which is a design that's really derivative of temples that the church was putting together in the 1990s, such as the Bountiful. And of course, this is what the Provo Temple will look like uh, in less plans change, of course, in the near future. Why is this sad? It goes back to the thesis of this presentation. Um, the Provo Temple documents a pivotal chapter of Latter-day Saint history, a moment when the church was preparing itself for unprecedented global growth and trying to understand how to make that growth possible, especially in terms of temples, right? This pinnacle experience of being a member of the, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Provo Temple stand, design stands out, especially among modern temples, many of which take direct cues from the Provo Temple. Again, if this temple can survive, its unique beauty will become more evident with time. Each passing year, the temple will become more beautiful to those who uh, drive past it, to those who actively use it, for those who live around it and enjoy its role as a landmark and a touchstone in, in the Provo community, in the uh, community of the church, both here along the Wasatch Front and across the world. So that is how I'm going to conclude my lecture today. I'm also going to remind you that if you would like to contribute to the effort to save the Provo Temple, this is taken from our Instagram post of yesterday, we ask you to send in comments uh, saying as much to uh, Mr. Juan Becerra. He's a wonderful member of the uh, church community relations department, and he has been designated as the one to take um, comments from the general public regarding this new Provo Temple design. And I've included his email there on the screen. But with um, no further ado, I see I've talked a little bit over my time. I'm sorry I went seven minutes over what I planned, but um, we do still have time, of course, to address uh, any questions from the audience. And I welcome those questions and, and, uh, and your further comments and insights. Thank you so much, David. This was illuminating. And yeah, we did have some questions within the chat, so I'll just hop right in there. Um, so, oh, and we did have a very important comment that you forgot. One analogy is it looks like a birthday cake, so. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder, lest we forget. Uh, that, yeah. I, will, I will say that's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think going along the lines um, that you so well summarized with, um, we had someone ask about how do we advocate to keep it, um, you know, and how do we make that a realistic goal? You know, we can, you know, put our comments to, to um, this individual, but what are other ways that we can actively show that we care and, you know, make sure that this building stays around? You know, I did gain some insights from the um, advocacy that went around the Manti Temple. I think uh, what helped to save the Manti Temple, at least helped the um, church leadership understand the affection that uh, members of the general public and church members specifically had for the building was the number of people that wrote in to the church, especially specifically to uh, Mr. Becerra, who was also um, assigned uh, to uh, take uh, public comment about that building. The number of people that helped, <coughs> uh, that wrote in and, and expressed their uh, opinions about the future of that building, I think really did help to save the, uh, the murals and the original floor plan of that building. So I would just encourage people to write in to Mr. Becerra and encourage their friends and contacts to do the same. We're coming into a uh, Christmas holiday. Uh, a lot of you will be seeing friends and relations and contacts. And I just encourage you to, um, to keep this uh, email address accessible and please share it with, uh, with everyone you come in contact with. I, I would personally thank you for doing so. And uh, I, I think that will help to at least uh, um, uh, uh, change maybe even the internal narrative that the church has about this building, which is that most people find it uh, uh, ugly or, um, or uh, irrelevant in, in 2021. And I would also encourage you to let us know um, if you're interested in getting involved. Um, any, any good advocacy is, starts at the community level. So if this is something you're passionate about, um, or interested in, let us know, because um, it helps, you know, we're one voice, but the more voices we can add is, is always so, so important. Um, we did have someone ask 
and I don't know if, if you know or if you found this in your research, David, um, what did the church leaders think of the Provo Temple when it first opened? Did they refer to it or think of it as being ugly? When the, there's a, there's an interesting story. When Emil Fetzer first presented the design that he worked out on uh, on that plane ride, and then, you know, through subsequent iterations. When he first presented that design to the First Presidency and members of the Quorum of the Twelve, essentially the church hierarchy, uh, the question was asked, I think it was the first question that was asked about the building, um, and it was directed to David O. McKay specifically, and uh, whoever asked this question said to David O. McKay, does this design offend you? which I thought was an interesting question. So did Emil Fetzer. When the question was asked, Emil Fetzer sort of panicked and thought, mm, do I need to design something that looks more like the Salt Lake Temple or some other uh, temple that, uh, that is, is, is more traditional in, in, in its design? But after reflecting on the question for a few seconds, David O. McKay essentially replied, I love it, let's build it. And from that point on, uh, the, the design of the temple was never questioned. So, so I think that the uh, leadership of the church did register the building as being new, and even daringly so, but uh, ultimately received uh, approval by David O. McKay, and, and that is why the building stands today. Excellent. We had someone comment and, and question. Um, we were wondering if they think, if you thought it being in Provo, is that an advantage or a disadvantage um, compared to, to other places considering, you know, that it's in a college town. Um, most of the people with experiences with the Provo Temple don't necessarily live in the community. Yeah, I, I mean, this really, this temple really is a global temple because so many who have used it, so many people who have gotten uh, their initial introduction uh, to the uh, temple uh, were missionaries or um, uh, members of the BYU community who have since, you know, moved elsewhere, went home to their, their the place of residence, really anywhere around the world. So uh, there is a rather diffused pool of um, hardcore admirers or individuals who formed um, uh, pivotal memories, life memories in this building, you know, these, these people are around the world. So that does make advocating for its uh, retention, I guess, a, a bit more difficult, but hopefully, especially with the help of um, everyone on this call and uh, everyone involved with the larger effort, we can reach as many of those people as possible. Um, we're, as Preservation Utah, as, as, as the local preservation advocates, we're going to try to share this on social media and Facebook and use modern technology to try to reach as many people and advocate for this building as, as, as we possibly can. Uh, I, I think it's important to note in terms of design, um, having this temple in Provo and, and its sister temple in Ogden was really central. Uh, I think that the church presidency, David and McKay and his counselors and members of the Quorum of the Twelve, decided to make these temples sort of experimental temples, even from the get-go, to try to understand how to make temples more affordable and more um, uh, easily constructed, right? Sort of experiment with new ideas um, uh, that, that, that they could export around the world. Um, I think that there was a sense that um, Provo and Ogden temples were at the center of, uh, for lack of a better word, word I'll just call it the Jello Belt. Um, you know, the 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 the, the Mormon cultural um, hearth, and uh, they therefore did not need to build a monumental temple to sort of use as 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 a, a PR outreach, like they did in Oakland or um, you know in in some of the earlier temples that were built, or, or as they did even after this temple was constructed, these two temples were constructed in say Washington DC, right? This was not a, an area that needed the monumental temple, rather this was an area where a temple could be built that experimented with new ideas and especially was made to be as efficient as possible to make as much temple work as possible um, actually occur, which of course these two temples uh, succeeded wildly at, at doing. 
Great. We have a few more questions, so I will keep asking, and I understand we're a little, or we've hit the hour, so if you need to, to depart, we completely understand, but if you have an extra five or ten minutes, we'll make sure we get everyone's questions answered. Um, there's a question which I think is a really good one to address about, um, I think, this building particularly, but, but you know, a lot of buildings that are in that, um, you know, modernism umbrella, uh, you know, how do, how do we respond to people when they just, you know, throw that it's ugly, you know, how, how can we deepen the conversation um, and, and get people to see beyond maybe something that they're not used to? I suppose just saying it's not ugly, it's astoundingly beautiful is not enough. You know, I think that modernism, the whole modernist conversation, whether it be in art or dance or architecture, was specialized and it requires a little bit of effort to, to understand where the conversation is going, right? This was a conversation that was sort of evolved out of a, a small group of cognoscenti, right? A small, small group of people that then, you know, went around the world, but still at its core was, was uh, not well understood or oftentimes misunderstood. I think it does require a little bit of knowledge of that conversation to fully appreciate. But even, even if you do not have that knowledge or if you don't want to make the effort to acquire it, I think even just walking around the temple and looking at its formal qualities and how they all come together and consider the context, the historical context, which really shaped this building, you can begin to appreciate it you can begin to see it in new uh, pivotal ways. Um, if, if, you, if you understand what the church was trying to do with the building and you understand even on a formal level how the building was made to work, and even those fine details, if you just observe those, not just drive past the building at 40 miles an hour for a few seconds, but actually take the time to get out of the car and just look at the building itself, its secrets will reveal themselves and its wonders will become more apparent and you'll gain a new appreciation of the building as a work of architecture, as a work of, of, of religious devotion, as an expression of religious devotion, as um, a, a, a landmark and touchstone, as I said before. That would be my recommendation. Um, understand the historic context. You can always share that with people. And then just invite them to look at the building, walk around it you know, especially set against the white snow like it is currently, it's just a beautiful building. One thing I also love about this building, and I happen to live close to it, is it does not block the views of the surrounding canyons and mountains. It sits, especially now that its uh, landscape has, has matured around it, it sits beautifully in its, its setting. And, um, and uh, it's, it's really just a wonder. <laughs> I mean, that's, that would be my suggestions as, as, yeah. as far as approaching people who, who consider it ugly. They just have not spent much time to really think about the building and I would encourage them to do so. Yeah, and I, I think it's a wider conversation too about, you know, modernist buildings in general of, um, I think we, we don't appreciate what we have until it's gone. Um, I think there are a lot of buildings today that we think are gorgeous, you know, these amazing historic, buildings that shape our landscape that were once thought as ugly too. As, as David mentioned before, we're kind of on that 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 um, precipice before, you know, it's considered historic enough. Um, so reminding people that we are quick to de demolish and, you know, it's very easy to tear down, very hard or impossible to bring back. Um, we had some other questions about, doo -doo -doo -doo, let me see. Um, oh yeah, so someone said pre preservation is obviously the goal here, but if that's not possible, a final formal documentation should happen. Um, would any intensive level survey be a good way to document the temple? Um, I, I would, I would if, it, if it is to be um, reconstructed, I would love to see uh, that intensive level documentation happen. Um, I, 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 especially with buildings that are demolished by the, the church, I do wonder if it does take a while, maybe even several years for that documentation to actually become available, if it happens at all. 
you know, a lot of these conversations are internal and a lot of these conversations not, you know, really get uh, aired in, in, in the public forum. So what the church plans to do as far as documentation, I don't know. I would love to see that happen. I would also love to see that documentation, if it does take place, to be made available to the, the, the general public sooner than later. But of course, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the church has planned as far as that is, is concerned, that question. Yeah. Um, we did have someone ask how to get in touch with us. That's super easy. Uh, David is our contact for this. So it's just david at preservationutah.org. And I've put that email in the chat. Um, we also had someone ask if we're recording this. We are. Um, we will get it out probably on Monday, depending on how speedy I am today. Maybe it'll go out <laughs> today. Um, but since it's a Friday, who knows? Um, yeah. All right. We had a question about um, someone heard that it would cost more to restore the temple than to just tear it down and rebuild a new structure. Do you know if that's the case? Um, you know, like with so many things, the church doesn't share numbers on these sorts of projects. Um, I, I will say that I do know, and it's documented, that the church invested even as, as recent as maybe seven or eight years ago in securing the foundation of the buildings in the case of, of an earthquake. Um, I, uh, so that work has, has, has happened in, in many ways. Therefore, you can consider this building half secured against the eventuality of an earthquake. Um, why they decided to um, essentially uh, demolish the building, reconstruct it, whatever you want to say, after that work had been done. I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, as recently as, as, again, seven or eight years ago, they had spent um, funding on marble floors where there was once carpet and the, the high traffic areas. Um, they had gilded elements of the building that had not been gilded before. It seemed like as of even just five, six, seven years ago, the church was investing in this building in a way that suggested they were interested in keeping it. I'm not really sure what happened, what internal conversations took place between that point of time and the present point of time to, to lead the church to the, the conclusion it needed to be reconstructed. I, I do know that a lot of other temples are being reconstructed. Essentially all the historic temples uh, have been uh, or will soon be uh, reconstructed. Um, so I would like the church to consider this as one of the pivotal historic temples, which they don't seem to have, um, placed in that category. They don't seem to, to, to want to do or be willing to do. I, I can't guess why, but, but that is what ultimately we're advocating for is that the church treat this historic temple much like they have treated the, the Mesa, Arizona temple, Salt Lake temple, of course. Um, St. George has been uh, recently uh, or is undergoing a, a reconstruction. So to put this temple in that category of buildings that, that merit the effort. And I would also comment, I wouldn't be a good preservationist if I didn't mention this, but, um, you know, building costs are one thing. Um, and restorative costs, but the, the, the carbon footprint of a building, um, often that is not accounted for, um, rarely is it accounted for, and that's a lot of money. How much money do we end up paying um, in the long term for demolishing buildings? Um, so that's another account or another cost to account for. Um, we had a question about, um, are you aware of any formal efforts to celebrate the 50th anniversary of a temple? And could you know this be a way to help preserve it if there, there is any sort of birthday party <laughs> at the birthday temple? Um, well, we have thought of doing something, of course, uh, at Preservation Utah. Um, what those celebrations might be uh, from out of our office uh, is, is still something that we're, we're sorting out. Um, I don't think the church has any plans to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the, of the temple, which I believe falls the dedication date is in early February. I think it might be February 9th. I could be wrong um, on that. But, uh, but I think that's a great idea. And, and uh, I think that having a, a broad celebration of this building's 50th anniversary, a building that's contributed so much um, to, to the church's progress and, and its evolving uh, practices, 
especially in regards to temple worship is, is entirely merited. So um, uh, write us and, and let's plan something. Yeah. And as a reminder for, for those on um, part of the conversation, uh, 50 years is the, the mark for when buildings become eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So it is um, kind of a standard benchmark within the preservation community of, of when something's considered old enough uh, to be um, further recognized. Um, we did have a question, uh, other than the Ogden and potentially Provo temples, are there any other temples that have been completely, I would assume like demolished and then rebuilt? I mean, aside from the Nauvoo temple, no. Um, and I think the church's use of the word reconstructed is telling. Um, you know, really, if you look at those pictures of Ogden, probably would have been easier for the church just to have completely demolished that building and started over. I think there's this general hesitancy, even with a building that may not be um, fully embraced by church leadership, to, to demolish what has been considered for upwards of 40, 50 years as a house of God. Hence the, the approach of reconstruction. Um, how economical reconstruction is, as opposed to just outright demolition, um, is, is, is debatable. Of course, I don't know those numbers, only the, the church would, or how much um, all of that would compare to a restoration of the building, a, a further um, seismic stabilization of the, of the structure, I don't know. But there does seem to be, it, it is interesting that the church takes this approach of reconstruction as a way, I think, probably on some high level, to avoid talking about demolishing what has been a house of God, keeping at least a core of it and letting it continue onwards. I, I think it's interesting, as far as I understand, on the cornerstone of the Ogden Temple, even though that building was essentially um, taken down to the, the studs and beyond, it still has the date of uh, 1970, 1971. So the church, in their own calculations, sees the building as being a... A, 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 a continuous uh, uh, sort of uh, statement, uh, religious and architectural uh, from 1971 up to the present time, even though of course it underwent this, you know, extreme transformation. Great, um, we had one last question, I think before we'll conclude. And um, this person was just wondering, uh, to talk about the temple's unique design um, a little bit more. So the, the pillar of fire and the cloud that the children of Israel followed to the wilderness, um, if you knew the reason behind including that. Well, I think it's a lovely image. Now, um, having said that, I'm, I'm not confident that that was an image uh, that uh, Emil Fetzer, uh, the church's architect, or other people who worked on the project intended uh, I think that was uh, something that came after the building was built, but it's um, entirely appropriate to see the building as, as that. I know many people have interpreted it, the building as, as an expression of that, of that passage from the Old Testament over the last 50 years. And I, I don't, I think it should continue. I think this idea of the pillar of fire and the cloud guiding the children of Israel, you know, as manifest in the building is, is, is really a, quite a beautiful one. But again, I'm not sure that it was intended by the actual architects. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, David, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I know I learned a lot and there are lots of comments in the in the chat so i think hopefully we're planting seeds all of you now have tools to go out there and next time someone calls the provo temple empty or uh, ugly you have um <laughs> lots of ways to respond um but yes please reach out to us uh david at preservationutah.org or myself kelsey at preservationutah.org we'd love to get in touch about how you can get involved in this work or other advocacy we are a small team of four um david and i are the two that do statewide advocacy um, so it's that end of the year time. If if you like what we do, I put a link in. Please consider supporting us. Get a member, you know, have you forgotten a birthday present or a Christmas present for your mom or dad? Perfect gift membership to Preservation Utah. Um, but that being said, thank you so much for being here. We'll get this presentation out to you all um, so you can share on our YouTube channel. Stay safe, enjoy the snowy winter wonderland, and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much.
Thank you all. We really appreciate you participating in this uh, in this event. Take care. Happy holidays.